the Hollywood China Dealmakers panel is finally on. Thank you very much. I welcome Rob to take over this panel. Thank you, Rob. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, thanks, everybody, for sticking around. I know we're a little bit behind schedule, so we're going to make this a bit shorter than we had originally planned. And we have uh, a big panel of some very distinguished speakers. So uh, I'm going to jump right into it. This is uh, the Hollywood China Dealmakers panel. Uh, we're going to talk about deal making between Hollywood and China. Uh, I know there are some very sophisticated deal makers in the audience, so uh, we'll do our best to, um, you know, to uh, not tell you things you already know. And, uh, and, and uh, what um, I'll do is I'll just have uh, all of our speakers very quickly introduce themselves. My name is Rob Kane. I'm with Pacific Bridge Pictures, a writer, producer, entrepreneur. Uh, I've been doing business in China, I think, almost as long as uh, William, about almost 30 years. And I'd say for about the past five or six years, Every venture I've done, every film I've made, TV project, it's all been financed by Chinese investors. Uh, William, please introduce yourself. Hello. I've been in Asia for 33 years doing the film and TV production, distribution, and channel business, TV channel business, for Hollywood studios as well as my own companies. Most recently, Dragon Gate expanded into uh, Global Gate, where we now are making local language uh, feature films around the world. China is a very big and important part of our company. Our partners are Lionsgate. We have 10 partners, and they include uh, big companies like Gaumont in France, Televisa in Mexico, Caracao in Japan, Lotte in Korea, and so on. So we're making local language movies around the world. And thanks, guys, for the invite. I'm John Garrison. I uh, most recently was at the Wanda Group in Beijing, uh, and prior to that, spent 10 years at Goldman Sachs in investment management. For the last year, I'm more of an entrepreneur, but I'm also a senior vice president with Castle Hill Partners in Beijing. We're a specialty merchant bank, uh, focusing mostly on sports, entertainment, and media transactions. And so we have advisory clients, we have clients that we're managing transactions for, and uh, the occasional strategic fundraise. Is this one on? Hi, everybody. My name is Max Epstein. I'm the VP of Content Strategy at DMG Entertainment. DMG is a uh, global entertainment company. We're a content-centric company. Uh, we are publicly listed on the Shenzhen Stock Exchange, and we have an office in Los Angeles. Hi, everyone. My name is Christina Chow. I am an agent in uh, corporate development at CAA which is a global talent agency with offices in the US, the UK, India, China. Um, corporate development, as you know, is different with every company, but we have a buy and build strategy. My focus is really on the APAC region, so we have an office in China for the past 11 years. My focus is on the local language market, investments, growth in that area. Hi, everyone. My name is Jun Huang. I'm a corporate transactional partner at uh, Nixon Peabody. Uh, Nixon Peabody is a full-service global law firm uh, with 700 attorneys and 16 offices around the world. Uh, I personally focus on real estate and corporate law. Um, I work extensively on cross-border transactions between Chinese companies and uh, U.S. companies. Um, in particular, I help you know, Chinese institutional investors companies and wealthy individuals uh, for their investment in the U.S. Um, I am based in San Francisco and have been practicing law in the Bay Area for about 10 years. Hi guys, my name is David Uslin and I am uh, a partner at Uslin Entertainment. I'm actually partnered with my father, Michael Uslin, who is responsible and produces all the Batman films, the National Treasure movies, the Lego movies. Uh, we most recently announced our upcoming Doc Savage film that we're doing with Shane Black and Neil Moritz that The Rock just attached himself to star in that goes into production early next year. Uh, most of our production financing uh, and development financing now comes from China and South Korea. Uh, I am there every other month and have been doing this now for a number of years. 
Uh, we are partnered with many different media companies throughout Asia, but specifically in China and South Korea. Uh, and uh, uh, I work with a number of people in this room and outside and, and some of the folks uh, sitting at this table. And uh, China is very much the future of this business in many ways. And uh, it is our priority now for both the global content that we produce as well as the local Mandarin language content that we are producing now as well. And uh, I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. This topic we're talking about, deal making between uh, Hollywood and China, has become an incredibly important one. There's been such a surge of uh, deals and size of deals and volume, and it's. Uh, I think everybody on the panel would agree it's 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 never easy. There are just uh, so many challenges to doing these these kinds of uh, deals across cultural boundaries and, and distance. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, whoever would like to start first. Can you talk about a deal or a project uh, that you've worked on and concluded between a Chinese partner and, a, and an American partner? What were some of the obstacles you faced? Uh, what were some of the, the victories? And um, how did had things turn out after the deals were signed? Now, William, if you want to go ahead. Well, yeah, I've been doing business in China a long time. I guess uh, originally, uh, started producing TV shows there in the 80s for uh, for Disney and then set up the first Sino uh, uh, US studio um, joint venture between Sony and Zheng Xiaolong in, in 1993. We, we were putting TV shows on air, prime time, 8 o'clock, and, and that went very well. Um, and then the 30 regional channels started sort of maybe moving around the time slots, which made it very difficult, I think, to, to manage. Uh, and, and the, you know, the, the sort of sense of uh, the, the contract um, it, back then had a different meaning. You know, nowadays in the deals that we're doing, uh, they become very more international in the way uh, that deals are done and the respect for the contracts. Um, you know, things don't always go uh, to plan as they as they would. Um, you know, and, and there is an issue. We we had uh, a couple of years ago uh, a three picture deal with a, a major Chinese. Uh, production studio and uh, you know the first film went really well but there was under reporting and there was all of these things that we had to dig in to try to uh, you know figure out uh, hopefully over time I think now that the, the Chinese companies becoming much more international uh, they're publicly listed some of them have big businesses overseas there's a lot at stake and, and I think that uh, you know their um, propensity uh, to, for, toward funny business is probably much diminished and I think the respect for the relationships, the contract, the concern for the reputations, the understanding that huge businesses uh, a value is uh, at, at stake if uh, your reputation is affected is, I think, well understood now. So I think there's a much greater respect for, uh, for deals. I was going to comment briefly. Having come out of the Wanda group, and I joined Wanda right when they had formed their investment management uh, department to kind of consolidate all of their international uh, involvement and outreach, and especially a lot of that was investment. Uh, what fell to me eventually was, uh, it, originally I was touching everything, um, financial assets both in China, uh, outside of China, um, media and culture kind of assets eventually became my domain, but I was doing a bit of real estate um, early on as well. And I think one of the hallmarks of a Chinese deal that I'm, I'm experiencing now, even in some of my current deal flow, is um, the kind of unique uh, like stakeholder situation in a, in a Chinese deal. A lot of times you may be negotiating, and, I, and I've been on the sort of negotiation side from within a Chinese company even um, with a, a partner, and they're not aware that, uh, that nobody really has to say so until you get to the final, the chairman, and, and his sort of buyout um, sign off on the deal. And, uh, it, many of these Chinese conglomerates and, and larger firms that are acquiring, uh, that was very interesting. Eric me mentioned that he doesn't have a checkbook that he's carrying around with him, but that that kind of decision making is really going to be um, concentrated at the top. And so, getting the the deal into that the door of the chairman. So, like it, in the case of Wanda at Wang Jianlin's desk, early on and have a sense of of buy in approval. Uh, made all the difference. Um, all of the lower level people who were very excited about sort of the synergies, the strategic opportunity you may be presenting, maybe even sort of a return potential, 
um, don't count for a whole lot if you don't get to that level with the right pitch and the right sort of sail points. Um, one, one project that I can speak to that uh, DMG was involved with uh, was, it, it's been a few years, but I think with the, uh, with the recent success of a film like Skip Trace in the marketplace, it's still uh, relevant today. Again, this is more from, you know, DMG as a Chinese company. This is uh, perspective of a Chinese company working with uh, a U.S. company to, uh, to make, you know, a, a, a tentpole franchise film. Uh, Around Iron Man 3, this was 2012 when we, were, when we were producing the film and then 2013 when it was released. But um, we, we focused uh, a tremendous amount of time and energy, both sides, on figuring out how to make that film particularly relevant to the Chinese market. Um, Iron Man 2, when it was released, did about uh, 22 or 23 million dollars US in China. And um, DMG, having just co-financed and co-produced Looper, uh, really felt like we had something to bring to the table in working with Marvel and, uh, and Disney. And so we worked with them extensively on uh, which actors we would use. Um, also, tailoring the story in certain ways to make sure that uh, there were organic elements that really resonated with audiences there. Uh, and again, at this time, now we look back and we say, okay, well, there are lots of uh, films that have done that, you know, whether they were official co-productions or not. You look at what Transformers was able to do. But again, in 2013, even though it was only, or 2012, even though it was only four years ago, it, it feels like a lifetime. And, um, and so in, in working with Marvel and Disney on that process, uh, came to realize that yeah, Rob, I think as you were alluding, uh, it's a very, very tricky thing to, to make both kind of coasts happy. And uh, in that specific situation, we ended up with two different versions of the film, which was a bit controversial. But, you know, at the end of the day, in China, Iron Man 3 made $125 million. So, and, and again, the, you know, there were probably two or three years between Iron Man 2 and 3. So it can be very difficult, uh, you know, specifically around that project, it was making sure that both territories felt like, or I guess both companies felt like they were really getting uh, films that audiences would be happy with in their territories. Um, but, uh, but, you know, you can find a tremendous amount of success if you, uh, if you continue to work uh, with your partners. Um. So the example that I can speak to requires a little bit of background. So most people see talent agencies as the um, pain in the butt intermediary between casting your film or um, uh, finding a good director for your project. And I think the agencies maybe at some point were like that. And in the last, um, in the last 10 years have really changed to go from a blunt force instrument um, to a Swiss Army knife. So the idea is that um, you know you can come to an agency and hopefully fulfill a lot of your needs, whether it's talent, whether it's packaging, whether it's a conversation around consulting or investments, and I'm a part of that team that is a little bit more flexible. So our role there is really to ask the question, how do we expand the global footprint of CA in international markets? Um, so what we had to do was say, you know, admit to the fact that we don't know anything about it. So 11 years ago, we sent a brave group of people to Beijing to set up shop there. And through, um, you know, a decade of experience there have learned um, to, to a certain extent what the needs are. And I think that was the starting point of what can we do to leverage the expertise that CA has in specific areas and really have it intersect in an organic and collaborative way in China. Um, and of course, in the last 10 years, um, a lot of the conversations have been around um, film finance. So um, obviously there was an appetite um, in China to invest into big studio films, right? And five years ago, that was very difficult. So what we were able to do is, you know, really start to educate the market that we have a department called film finance, and what they do is specialize in the packaging and financing of independent cinema. Um, we had a lot of filmmakers and writers that were dissatisfied with doing franchises or doing um, 
you know, these great blockbuster films, and they had a specific narrative that they wanted to show, and we believed in that. So what we were able to do is, through 10 years of just going to China and sitting down with them, say, um, and, and then sitting down with our filmmakers and saying, this is the importance of the local language market. Year over year, you see a greater percentage of Chinese people that are becoming more and more screened, right, that are becoming more and more interested in watching local narratives and local content and saying, how can we intersect the two? So um, a couple of the deals that we closed recently, one was with a Chinese producer, um, Bliss Media, with Yozu, which is a Chinese game company. And we helped um, the, with the strategy and the, the essentially um, the managing of the fund of a $150 million film finance film. Uh, fund, um, which to this date has financed Hacksaw Ridge with Mel Gibson, um, a fantastic film starring Natalie Portman um, about Jackie O, um, as well as Michael Mann's Enzo Ferrari. So those are just a couple to start on. Um, and it, we haven't stopped there. So candidly, there are a lot of other opportunities for our filmmakers to say, how do we engage with local players in China? And how do we engage in not only doing big global international projects, but also local language films. Who do we work with there in a very cohesive way? And a lot of that had to take, a lot of that took education, time, um, advocacy within the building, and also within the industry. Uh, I recently just did a deal between a Chinese company and a US company. Um, it was a pretty significant deal and the executives of both sides um, you know, set aside one week from their busy schedule um, to just kind of like, you know, meet at a neutral location and all the relevant parties like you know, lawyers, consultants, all of them were invited to uh, attend the meeting. So you can see you know, it's a, uh, both sides are pretty enthusiastic about the deal. Um, but the first day of the negotiation turned out to be pretty awkward other than you know, the usual complicated legal and uh, business issues that the parties encountered, um, you know, the biggest shock came from, that came from more like the cultural differences between uh, the two parties, essentially the different negotiation style. So basically, the Chinese companies you know, started with a counter offer that was really, really aggressive and refused to kind of, you know, um, to move anywhere closer to uh, the, China, the, the American company's position. And the American company was a little bit shocked and you know, felt insulted by the lowball offer. And at some point, almost walked out of the, be the meeting. <laughs> but from you know, the Chinese company's perspective, it's pretty common that you know, they will start an uh, offer really low and so that you know, uh, for any business negotiation, that's how they used to do things. Um, so they have plenty of room to do the dance right later on, and generally, uh, you know, unlike American negotiation style, which could be a little bit more direct and sometimes more time efficient, Chinese expected that um, business negotiation to be a pretty long, time-consuming process, um, and you know that's how they used to do things. But apparently, uh, the American company didn't really expect that, and they were really frustrated by that. Uh, and because they were frustrated, the Chinese companies think that you know they were not uh, serious about it, or you know they were too arrogant to engage in negotiation. So the first day of the meeting ended badly, and you know, the negotiation was you know going nowhere. Um, and this is not really uncommon in the deals that I did between like Chinese companies and U.S. companies. Uh, oftentimes, the biggest you know obstacle or challenges associated with this kind of deals are not you know the usual business uh, or legal issues that the deals themselves have. Uh, instead, you know the main obstacles comes from the cultural differences between the parties. And you know, as an advisor, oftentimes that's kind of where we really step in, not just kind of like explain um, the law and explain the issues, but mainly just point out you know, the, the gaps in between and try to bridge those gaps. So after the first day's meeting, you know, both sides meet uh, their, with their counsels, and on my end, I try to just explain uh, the different negotiation styles of both parties and try to you know, point out you know, what they can uh, really think about to um, make it work. And uh, I think you keep the, the common ground in mind so the second day, the meeting went much better because the, you know, both parties pretty much just started the negotiation uh, as a fresh start 
uh, and just try to kind of like keep uh, the common interest in mind. Um, you know, and eventually the deal was signed up uh, at the end of the week-long meeting. Uh, <laughs> that was pretty kind of like a pretty typical situation where you have significant deal between the two parties. And we'll see like, you know, how the deals is gonna play out because this is really a long-term process. It's a relationship's like 30 years plus. And to me, I think it's important to recognize all of those differences and it's good to encounter that kind of like, obstacles, you know, at the beginning so that the parties can work together in eventually and, you know, kind of like build up the trust along the way. Yeah, Jinjin, Jin, that's, that's a great example. And I, I wanna just add to that an observation of mine I've, as I've been a, uh, both the principal and also a consultant to a lot of deals between Chinese and U.S. companies. And very often the U.S. or, or non-Chinese company will send their top executives, very high paid attorneys, people who are ready to go and, and, and in fact impatient about getting a deal done. Right. On the Chinese side I've seen very often they will send people without decision making authority, often very lower level executives who I want to call them sort of the department of wearing down the other side. And their only job is to prevent a deal from happening, set a deadline for it, and get the other side to sort of panic at the 11th hour and get them to give in on things that they wouldn't otherwise give in on. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually what happened too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and there are many things that can cause a deal to hang up, I think. Even the interdepartmental um, issues in a, in a Chinese firm are sort of designed to block a lot of things um, going through. And I think it helps for a foreign party to be aware of that, that you're going to deal with issues from the legal department, the cost control department, the taiwupu, the finance department. All, all of these guys are going to have some kind of input. And I think if you have parties that are sort of at the investment level, um, I, I deal with this with my partner in Beijing now. And just being aware of those internal issues, we can provide some options and alternatives to get through those. Um, it kind of made me think a little of um, just two other observations. And one is to help your party, your counterpart, clarify the process. What I see a lot of times, and what we try to avoid where, where I'm working with Castle Hill partners and even on some of the independent projects I'm working on, is we try to avoid going to uh, a counterpart in China with a, a pretty raw idea that's going to require a lot of cultural adaptation within their, I mean, corporate culture adaptation within their organization to digest this asset or to develop this asset and, and knowing that's not really what that organization does very well. And so you can do a lot to sort of package, as Christina was saying, like in packaging a film, you almost package your investment up with these are the people who will execute it that come with this transaction, um, these are the roles, Make clarify that whole process of, um, of the transaction and you're selling a much more uh, sellable product. I, I think I see a lot of people just see China as an op opportunity and uh, for capital and think, well, this seems like an attractive asset. Somebody should do, do something with it. Why don't we go try to sell it to someone in China? And it's just, I think that's a, a dead end. It's a good way to waste a lot of time. You know, Before we go to the next topic, David, did you want to try it? We, we kind of, let me give you a, a, a different approach, uh, an approach that we take to, to our relationships in China. You know, there will always be, maybe not always, but for now there's, there are language barriers there are cultural differences uh, with business etiquette and negotiations and all that good stuff. One of the things that we saw when we decided to take this pivot, one of the things that we realized was that all of these issues are not easy issues to get over. You know, I think that everybody here would agree that when, when we all run into road roadblocks, it, it takes time to go to, to get over those roadblocks. Uh, with us, we, we knew that we had to have a real presence in China that you know, we didn't want to have the appearance of just going there, looking for money, and looking for distribution, and then leaving. That this was a long-term play, that this was you know, very much our future. So when we started going to China, 
for the first, and this was about four or five years ago, for the first year, uh, we did not mention one word of any IP. We did not talk about money at all. It was all relationship building. And it was all using our relationships to extend and evolve other relationships there. So over the course of the year, year and a half, two years, we got to know many of our friends and people who became partners of ours and got to know them very personally. So when we did decide to get into business with them, we knew that we had the type of relationship where when we did run into those roadblocks, we'd be able to handle them uh, in a more effective way. And I'll give you one, one example. Um, we deal with a lot of rights issues. We are very much in the source material world. We are development producers. And when we were making one of our initial deals in China uh, around uh, a significant piece of IP, when we were doing our agreements, there was a um, there was uh, an issue that they had with E and O insurance, with errors and emissions insurance, and and I don't know how many people are are familiar with that, but it, it deals with rights issues and and clearing those rights issues, and and um, and when they saw that, now that's something that's very standard in our business and something that is standard with any production, but to to our partners and friends in China, when they looked at errors and omissions insurance, the first thing they thought of was, well. So these rights might not be the way that you say they are, so there might be an issue with them when there really isn't, when everything is completely clear, but it's a standard in our business. To them it very much wasn't, and it was something that they didn't understand, and something that caused quite the roadblock at the time. Now, we ended up getting past it, and we actually didn't include e &O insurance in that particular contract, but when we are now approaching production, of course it's in there, where, where it has to be, and it's pretty standard. So there are always going to be cultural issues, there's always going to be language barriers, but if you come at it in the approach that we have taken, uh, we've just seen it, it being a much more peaceful, stressless approach uh, than I believe the typical Hollywood approach. And, and again, I think it all comes down to, you know, having a real passion for what we're doing over there, having a real presence, treating our partners the way they should be treated over there, like real producing partners and having them have equal input and say both creatively and financially. And I think that if you, if you look at it from that perspective, while you might not be able to avoid certain roadblocks, you set yourself up for dealing with those roadblocks in a much more manageable way. Yeah, David, you, you actually just very nicely answered my next question. <laughs> uh, so thank you. Um, and You're now, welcome. Jeopardy style, I'll, uh, I'll give you the question. Um, you know, uh, and Jonathan mentioned this, and, and Eric Micah previously mentioned he, he doesn't show up with a checkbook. Very often, American media companies think about China with dollar signs in their eyes and think of Chinese companies mainly as sources of capital or, or distribution. Uh, but that's not always what. Chinese companies. In fact, it's 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 uncomfortable to send your money overseas, and and, and kind of a scary thing. So, um, uh, what can American companies do to be uh, more aware of their partners' needs and interests? And what can we do to be better partners for Chinese companies that we'd like to work with? Uh, just going in order here, I guess. The um, yeah, I think you know. The important thing is to have something of value to bring to them. I mean, for us, we, we're bringing intellectual property rights. We're bringing, uh, you know, scripts, uh, remake rights that that China needs at the moment. Um, you know, it's it's a great industry there, uh, and it's been growing very quickly beyond the ability of the infrastructure to support it. And when I talk about infrastructure, I'm talking about, you know, the number of directors and actors and writers. And so there's just not enough good. Uh, writers uh, and and uh, you know uh, enough good actors and directors and you, you've seen the quality of films probably uh, suffer as a result as so many companies are jumping in they're trying to uh, you know catch the zeitgeist of the market um, you know for us uh, we see a need for you know good content the Chinese know they need it we bring that to them they value what we bring we're actually bringing in financing as well so when the movies that we do there we finance uh, half fifty percent of the cost of production. They don't need our money, but in order for us to be able to 
uh, you know, invest in their movies, you know, we have to have something else, which is the intellectual property, which they do need. And then you're able to sort of strike a deal there that is, uh, you know, valuable to us because we're bringing something valuable to them. Uh, you know, if, if you're just going into China and trying to, to get something uh, that they have and get a piece of their market, it's, it's proven very difficult for a lot of companies. And there are a lot of regulatory issues that might pop up. I mean, we've done certain deals there where, um, you know, in, in the case of, let's say, the VOD business, uh, where, um, you know, we made an announcement and a couple of weeks later, uh, the regulations are changed that make that deal uh, very difficult to execute and everything had to be restructured uh, as a result. So, you know, the playing field can change beyond just the deal that you have with your partners there from a regulatory governmental point of view. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, trying to diminish that possibility uh, while uh, focusing on, you know, the things that they need is probably uh, the best way to create a good relationship, good partnership, a good deal there. One of, uh, one of the things that we've seen from the IP side, uh, which is, again, kind of our, our strong suit, is, uh, you know, historically, we as a family, uh, going back, you know, generations now, have been focused on acquiring content typically from North America or from Europe. And I think that over the last couple years, let's just say five to seven years, there's been a big shift uh, in terms of our mentality where we're finding content now and how we're acquiring that content. And while we're always going to be looking for the next big DC comic book to adapt and, uh, and turn into a big franchise, one of the things that we've found is the unbelievable growth and amazing content being generated now in Asia uh, in, in general, not only in China, but in South Korea, uh, as well as, as the rest of Asia and, and Southeast Asia, everywhere included. Uh, the Webtoons industry in Korea is gigantic. And if you're not familiar with Webtoons, it's very much like graphic novels and comic books, but digital with a little bit of motion and sound behind it. Uh, there are amazing books and content coming out of China right now, especially Especially on the digital side as those opportunities open up. So we're able to go in and acquire content that we see working globally as well as working locally, uh, depending. But we see great opportunities around content and, and that content there, although global and maybe Western in many ways, has a strong anchor into China and Korea already. It's got that strong origin there, so it re so people can relate to it, they can feel it, they can see it a lot easier than just some comic book that sells 25,000 or 30,000 copies in North America. So you look at events like the International Licensing Expo, which is in Las Vegas every summer, or you look at some of the events that organizations like COCA and COTRA in Korea are doing, the content is there. There's amazing content out there, and I think that that content generally appeals more to our partners in Asia than does just showing them some book that they're not familiar with. So I think from an IP side, uh, there is definitely a lot that has been uh, happening and evolving over the last couple years. We'll continue to see that, and when you go now to events like San Diego Comic-Con and New York Comic-Con, you see more Chinese and Korean publishers than you ever have. So I think that there's a bigger movement in general that's happening right now, especially with IP across many mediums. Again, we could sit and talk for hours about mobile games and what's happening on the VR side. I know that was touched on earlier, but it is there is a movement that's taking place right now, and there's there's very few people people at this table and others that we know that that go to these events, that look for that type of IP, and uh, uh, it's out there, and we're going to see a lot more of it. I think a lot of the other panelists have touched on it, but going in with a specific, I think what we see right now is that, to David's point, there is a lot of creativity and um, movement and growth in China. When you're on the ground um, in Beijing and you walk into, let's say, like a, a startup co-working space, there are 
30 startups there that are doing everything from developing their own MCN to microbreweries to their own comic platforms, and it's, it's great, it's fascinating. Um, there absolutely needs to be an eye on it um, and uh, a version of respect and humility um, that needs to be directed towards the region. I think what we see now, um, at least on our side, is a need for specialists. Um, in various categories, but um, I think, you know, as some of the other panelists have alluded to, development, um, you know, great IP. Um, so, you know, moving into the region, um, rather than saying we do 40 things, um, what we try to say is we do three things really well. Why don't we start here? Um, and then let's be iterative. Let's be smart. Let's um, develop a relationship. Um, but if we can satisfy, satisfy these three things or do one of the three or two of the three, um, let's figure out how we can move forward and expand our offerings and our relationship. Uh, I, I think this has been touched on uh, already a bit, but um, yeah, I, I totally agree. Knowing exactly what you want to uh, get out of a partnership with a Chinese company is very important from an American standpoint. And then also uh, understanding that, and again, this is, this is something that uh, people are, are coming to terms with more and more, companies are coming to terms with more and more when we work with them, but it's not the United States, right? And uh, if you're just looking at, you know, a microcosm of the, uh, the film industry, uh, if you want to get a film made here, obviously, you know, you go out and maybe find a sales agent. If you have a relationship with a distributor, you go directly to them. Uh, in China, the government plays such a massive role that whoever your partner on the Chinese side is going to be, you have to do your due diligence to ensure that they're going to be honest and forthcoming with you, but you also have to understand that that is such a, a massive undertaking to get anything from outside of China, certainly as it relates to a feature film, uh, into China in such a way that benefits both parties. Um, so understanding that and, and realizing that, um, that there are, it's, most of the conversations that we have around a lot of the projects that we do end up inevitably boiling down to you know, conversations around how can we, as the Chinese party, get what we need to make sure that both parties succeed in China. And oftentimes, those, those requirements are, uh, are odd or very, very unusual for an American company. So, you know, I, I would love to give specifics around this, but I, I, I think it's probably better not to, only because, you know, this stuff is always very sensitive. But, ensuring that you have the right partner, knowing exactly what you want to get out of that partnership, and then trusting that partner when it comes to dealing with bureaucratic entities in China that are absolutely necessary to success. Great. I think we've just got a couple more minutes. Is that right, Rebecca? So uh, last question for the panel. Um, where do you see things heading in the next five years in this relationship, deal-making between Hollywood and China? Uh, I promise you nobody's going to come back in 2021 to hold you to it. So uh, if you think your idea is maybe half crazy, go ahead. Just, just throw it out there. Lots of theme parks. <laughs> I don't know how many theme park deals I've been um, contacted about over the years and, and spent quite a lot of time at, when at Wanda with the theme parks um, group and, and also with people that were sort of, you know, trying to deal IP relevant to theme parks, many of whom had never built a theme park, had never had their IP highlighted or showcased in a, in a theme park uh, very effectively. I mean, really ambitious, but we'll see if that gets a lot of support. I think that'll really depend on whether so many of these um, second, third tier cities, uh, their municipal governments really want to support that. If they do and they make a land, land and a major development available for that, uh, they'll, you'll see a bit of a replication of what, what a company like Wanda has done happen in other places in, in China. I think that, you know, as China becomes the largest uh, movie market in the world, it'll be very difficult for them to justify, given, you know, international pressure, uh, the protection, uh, protectionism that, you know, they, they currently are uh, engaged in in terms of quotas and restrictions on distribution and you know just participation. I, I believe that you know things will 
uh, continue to open up, at least I'm optimistic, and a lot of it depends on what happens in our election in, in the United States as well. Um, but I, I would have thought that you know, if things go on uh, the, the expected course or the hoped for course in that regard, that you know, the, the barriers will start to come down. Uh, you're gonna have a lot more interaction uh, between Hollywood and, and China and other uh, you know, countries around the world with China. Uh, there's going to be, um, you know, a much more collaborative I interaction. There are more Chinese people studying overseas than any place else. A lot of people learning English. A lot of uh, foreigners, Americans and, and others, are learning Chinese. So the language barriers, barriers will become less and less of an issue. Uh, the people's style of doing business, their, their familiarity with, you know, accepted international um, kind of concepts and deal making in uh, respecting partnerships and respecting contracts will improve over time. And, and so, you know, and, I'll, and I think that you're already seeing Chinese companies buying up uh, American companies and other foreign companies in entertainment and related uh, areas so that, um, you know, their understanding of how that operation uh, works, the way that will influence, uh, you know, those companies back in China to become more international will be all very positive things. So I think, you know, five years from now, uh, a much more, um, you know, harmonious kind of uh, relationship where it's less us versus them. And, uh, you know, I think you're going to see some very successful um, partnerships where Chinese are, are very international outward focused people, you know, perhaps less so than, uh, I mean, the Japanese would be less so, right? I mean, the Chinese are very different. They've always been going out to the world. They're very open uh, to learning. And, uh, you know, despite some um, tendencies towards nationalism on a micro level, I think on an overall business level, it, it is a much more open area. So the partnerships will improve. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say that, uh, you know, this was the first time in, I believe, over a decade, probably longer, that, uh, you know, during a, you know, during a quarter, uh, theatrical, uh, you know, grosses have actually decreased in China. And I think that uh, China is going to become the biggest territory in the world as, there, as it stands for theatrical. But I do think that you, a lot of folks are going to be surprised at, uh, at where the, uh, the, the territory kind of caps out. I think that... Uh, as it relates to the United States, we're probably overscreened here, and I think that there's going to be a very, very quick pivot uh, to a lot of the immersive uh, stuff that's coming out as it relates to China, and also uh, digital, I think, is going to continue to, to grow in interesting ways in location-based entertainment. But as it relates to theatrical, I think it's... Uh, it's, it's very telling that, uh, that this quarter there was actually this, you know, this past quarter there was actually a decrease in, uh, in gross for box office. Um, for me, I think, um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm far from, I'm not as pithy as our other panelists, but I, if I just had to throw out a wish list of things that I feel like we will see in the next five years or 10 years, um, you know, obviously, as they mentioned, VR, immersive technology, um, the influencers, KOLs, Wang Hong in China, I'm, I'm interested in seeing their perspectives, their narratives, um, how they can bridge into um, more traditional media. Um, and what I'd candidly love to see is, um, and what I predict is the rise of female executives, female business owners, female narratives, female um, uh, directors. Um, William mentioned there are a lot of Chinese students and international students that are studying in USC and UCLA. Um, candidly, we've worked with a lot of them on the agency side and signed a lot of them because they're incredible and talented and um, third culture and fully bilingual and the majority, vast majority, are women. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to talk about politics here, but there's definitely a cracking of the, grass, uh, of the glass ceiling for just women in the U.S. So, um, you know, China being as rapidly growing as they are, um, I would love to see that as well. Yes. You're here. Yes. <laughs> uh, just really quick. Um, I think, you know, for sure, the China kind of like, the Chinese capital outflow is going to continue because, um, you know, the Chinese domestic market is sort of like increasingly becoming more volatile. The stock market there in the past year is more like roller coasters, which makes a lot of investors nervous. Um, so they're looking for, you know, kind of like safer investment outside of China and U.S., in, you know, particularly in California is the best choice for a lot of Chinese investors. And another thing is just that, you know, the, uh, 
the China component, I think, is going to play a very uh, more significant role in many kind of like big hit, you know, uh, films. I think just like Kung Fu Panda 3 and Warcraft, is, you know, the recent success shows that um, the, ch the Chinese component or the Chinese culture um, that's incorporated into the film is actually, you know, just kind of like make the film become uh, such a big, you know, uh, a success. Especially for Warcraft, which will be otherwise just be swimming in the red, but you know, because of its kind of a massive success in China, it has such a uh, impressive um, uh, uh, as revenue. And I th the fundamental reason is that it sort of like captured the taste of China's middle class. And what happened was that Warcraft was, as a video game, was released in early 2000s when China's internet access was growing. And so a lot of people in their 30s, they sort of like developed, you know, this love affair with Warcraft from their teenage years. So when the movie came out, they were all excited and, you know, they can't wait to see it. Uh, that's a very important reason. And I was thinking that um, people are realizing that um, knowing the Chinese culture and try to uh, tailor the film towards Chinese taste is getting more and more important. I would think five years from now, more films is going to be made, you know, just uh, towards that direction. Where to start? Where to start? Um, First, uh, I had the pleasure of being at the opening day of Shanghai Disneyland. And when I say that theme park was incredible, it was incredible. And I am a theme park fanatic. So I cannot wait to see everything that is going to be built over the next couple of years. I've seen some other theme parks across China that have been mind-blowing as well. And I think that from that side, there is just going to be some amazing stuff coming. Uh, I think that before we blink our eyes, China will be the biggest VR market in the world. And I think that's going to be unavoidable. Uh, they're the biggest mobile gaming market in the world already, and that mobile gaming market is about three times the size of their film business, and I think that the growth that we're going to see in that sector is going to continue to skyrocket over the next couple of years. Uh, I think that the number and increase of management companies and agencies focusing on talent that could bridge both of these markets is going to continually be on the rise. Uh, the amount of new management companies that I've seen uh, open their doors in the last six months uh, has been shocking, and I can't imagine what that's going to look like in a couple years. And uh, I think that we're going to see huge growth in the publishing sector as well. And I think before we know it, they'll be the number one publishing market in the world, probably in the next couple of years. And the one thing that I am also very excited about is with all of this this evolution that is taking place right now, I think that we're going to see a significant increase in the amount of quality uh, screenwriters come out of China. And that's one of the things that that market lacks, I think, more than ever when it comes to film. And I think that with the number of global talent now working in China, with all of us and everything that we do in our daily lives, I think that the impact that that's going to have in that market in the next couple of years is going to be significant. And I would love to have, personally, have, an, have access to a greater pool of great Chinese screenwriters uh, than is available right now. Well, thank you all so much. I've really learned a lot listening to it. Thank you all. Chinese ownership, so 